creation in a heart Crying out to the heavens On the plains of our affairs Standing proud beside my brother Silent at Mustafa بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and my dear brothers and sisters in humanity I welcome all of you with the greetings of peace Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I welcome you once again for this unique series of interviews wherein we invite scholars of Islam, experts, students of knowledge and da'is from all across the globe who come and share with us the different and the beautiful facets of Islam and its teachings and also help us in overcoming the challenges that which we Muslims face as individuals and communities in the present day world and in this series of interviews we have been discussing on a very important and an interesting topic of the virtues of the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah and to discuss on this subject we have with us our dear Sheikh, Dr. Haytham Al Haddad from UK. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Sheikh, alhamdulillah, since the past five episodes, we have learned a lot about the other acts of worship that which are associated with the month of Zul Hijjah. And in the previous two episodes, we also learned about the fiqh rulings pertaining to the way how to determine the beginning of the month of Zul Hijjah and the various scenarios that which can arise in this regard. Today we would like to start with the topic of what is the wisdom that certain days or certain times or certain places Allah wa ta'ala has given them more virtue or it is special in nature as compared to the other days, other times and other places. So what is the wisdom behind it that Allah chooses or Allah prefers certain days, certain times, certain places over the others. Could you please tell our audiences what the wisdom okay. is? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Again, this question, Brother Kaleem, wouldn't be asked by maybe Muslims who lived in the first or second, third hijra, or maybe who lived two, three hundred years ago. But this is a very frequent question now. This is among, as they say, fact frequent asked questions. Most commonly asked questions. Most commonly asked questions. These days why? You know, when Islam became weak and in particular the Western civilization became prevalent or became dominant. So Muslims started, many Muslims, not all, some Muslims started to look up to the Western civilization. And they started to look up to the Western values. And among the Western values that they fought for a long period of time is equality. Equality between individuals, equality between people, equality between opposite genders. Men are equal to women. Black are equal to white, etc. Now, they talk about equality as a principle or as a value. Maybe they don't apply it carefully or they don't apply it genuinely but this is another issue but at least theoretically they have this principle as a result of this we as Muslims these days started to question anything that is against equality we've been influenced by the issue of equality although we might say that we are not influenced by it that's why this question and other questions were raised why do we say that there are days better than other days, places better than other places. And now I received another question, which is related to this discussion frequently. Are Arabs better than Ajam? Are Arabs better than non-Arabs? What is the language of people in Jannah? Why it is Arabic? Is Arabic better than non-Arabic? Okay. And then this led to another discussion, which is, who said that Muslims are better than non-Muslims? Okay. Very strange. All of these questions came from the same principle, which is, aren't things equal? And I think the prominence 
of Western civilization influence this question. Now, to give an answer, Allah Jalla wa'ala have given an answer for all of these scenarios in one simple ayah, brief ayah. وَرَبُّكَ يَخْلُقُ مَا يَشَاءُ وَيَخْتَارُ مَا كَانَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةِ Rabbuk, Allah, your Lord, is the one who creates. So the creation belongs to who? Belongs to Allah. If he is the creator, he is the one who decides. He is the one who has the right over everyone. He is the one who knows everyone. أَلَا يَعْلَمُ مَنْ خَلَقْ doesn't know the one who creates what he created or doesn't the one who creates know which means because he created he knows everything about his creation the manufacturer of this laptop knows everything about this laptop I'm not more qualified to know about the laptop than the manufacturer of this laptop of course Allah created us all Allah knows about us all this is one thing the other thing, we all belong to him. So if, if Allah it chose to give preference to certain people, to certain individuals over the other, why we complain about it? See, I know that many scholars, many speakers, they might give an, a different answer. But I want to have the right approach, which is total submission to the Creator. Definitely. Total submission to the Creator. And moreover, Allah says, لا يسألوا عما يفعل وهم يسألون. Nobody questions Allah. Nobody questions Allah. Who has the right to question Allah? And the questioning Allah is arrogance, it might be kufr. So Allah created us all. And he is the Lord, he is the supreme being, he is the creator, he is, he is, he is, he is. And we are nothing. This arrogance of the human being, I am. Ya yeah, akhi, we are nothing. A mosquito. Yeah, a mosquito. Subhanallah, today, today, in the hotel, mashallah, is clean, very clean, tidy. I saw a very small insect very small insect i don't know where it came from i noticed that it was under the cup that's why i noticed it i was surprised how where did this come very small very tiny and then i said okay anyway i'll kill it it, it will not cause anything then i said subhanallah the viruses are more tiny than this we don't see them by the naked eye that's correct agree agree but they will cause harm to the human being is that true or not? Of course. So you, me, the human being, will be challenged by something very tiny that I cannot... Ultra-microscopic. Ultra-microscopic. I might die because of that. Uh, Agree? Agree. So me, as the human being, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. And as you said, Sheikh, that you know, different people may have a different perspective to this. What I think as well is that along with knowing that Allah wa ta'ala cannot be questioned for what he does. So if a person truly understands Allah, that Allah is also al-ad, he's just. If he prefers certain things or certain times or places over the others, we should know that he's also just and he will never be unjust in the least degree. Ah, so the question is, the main question is, is Allah unjust to me? Yeah, this is the question. As you said that Allah is al-adl. So I should not be arrogant. That's true. The key thing is, am I treated justly by Allah or not? Yeah? Allah might prefer some people over others. This is his creation. He is not questioned about this. But the main question is, is Allah just to all of us? Is Allah going to punish me while I am a good person? No. Is Allah going to throw me in the fire of hell? Although I used to listen to him and adhere to what he says, this is injustice. Okay? And as he said, Allah Jalla wa'ala is al-adil. Allah malikul mulk. وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا Yes? وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا And as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, الظُّلْمُ ظُلُمَاتٌ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ ظُلْم leads to darkness on the day of resurrection. Yeah? 
and Allah Jalla wa Ala purified himself from being involved in something that the Prophet Sallallahu or himself condemned. And there are many verses and ayat and statements from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that Allah Jalla wa Ala is not unjust. Allah Jalla wa Ala is Al-Adl from all angles. Definitely, mashallah. However, that does not negate that. The justice of Allah does not mean that Allah wouldn't prefer certain places over the others. Moreover, another angle, which is when Allah Jalla wa Ala prefers certain places or certain times over the other, this does not cause harm for the rest. And when he prefers certain times, certain days, certain individuals even, certain places, certain activities, those activities, because he liked them more, Allah puts more barakah, more khair, more goodness in them. Mashallah. Yes, this is a very important principle. We will continue on the same topic, but after the break. Crying out to the heavens, to the heavens, on the plains of Arafat. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome after the break, and we were discussing with the Shaykh about the topic of Allah preferring certain times, places, and certain nations or certain people over the others. Yes, Shaykh. Yes, so I was saying, if Allah Jalla Ala chose Mecca to be the best of places, okay, over Europe, Mecca is very hot, and we have to go to do Hajj in Mecca, not in London, green, nice, yeah, no, Allah يخلق ما يشاء, Allah creates whatever he wants, and ويختار. And he is the one who chooses. Ma kana lahum al It is not up to them to decide or to choose. So, when Allah Jalla wa Ala chooses certain times over the others, certain places over the others, Allah gives those times or those places more barakah, more goodness, more khair, more benefit for a human beings. MashaAllah. So it's a benefit for us humankind. So it is a benefit for us as well. Allah Jalla wa Ala will not choose certain days for us. Yeah? And he says, do it in those days that you are going to harm yourself. If there is an imaginary harm, like for example, Allah says, go to jihad. And we know that jihad, we will be killed. Allah Jalla wa Ala said, كُلْتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْقِتَالُ وَهُوَ كُرْهُ لَكُمْ Qital was prescribed upon you and Although you may dislike it. You dislike it. وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرُ لَكُمْ You may dislike something but It is good for you. It is good for you. So if we see that there is harm in fact there is a lot of khair in it. So there is no absolute harm in what Allah Jalla wa'ala chooses for us. Allah Jalla wa Ala, out of His Majesty, it shows Him, as Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, اِخْتَارَ مَكَّةَ عَلَى سَعِرِ الْبِلَادِ Allah Jalla wa Ala chose Mecca over the other countries. And we should not question that. And Allah put khair in Mecca. Now there are some scientific facts that you need to visit Mecca and do tawaf to reset your charges. And maybe that is true, maybe that is wrong. Allah These are the Allah secondary Allah things that which we can think of. They are very secondary things. If they are true, alhamdulillah, if they are not true, it's all right. Even fasting, now it has been proven, the scientific fact, if you fast two days every week, then you will live longer, your health will be better, etc. But there is another study that says if you fast 13, 14, and 15, in particular, where the moon is full, and its power is strong. The circulation is very aggressive in your body. And then you tighten that with fasting. This will give you a better life and you will be a better, healthier person. Mashallah. There are some studies like this. Subhanallah, Allah is the one who chose 13, 14 and 15. And the Prophet ﷺ used to fast them. So Allah put khair in fasting them as well. Okay? Allah Jalla wa Ala, it chose the month of Ramadan 
It is up to him why he chose the ninth month, the ninth lunar month. Maybe there is khair in it. Allah Jalla wa ala chose the first ten days of the Hijjah to be more virtuous and the acts to be more rewardable and encouraged us to do more in those ten days of the Hijjah. Allah decided that the Hajj will be on the ninth day of those ten days. Why did Allah Jalla wa ala choose this? It is not to, up to us to question Allah Jalla wa ala. But definitely there is khair in them, in the dunya and in the akhirah. And this shows the principle of submission to Allah Jalla wa ala. MashaAllah. In fact, as this scholar said, the entire hajj, the entire hajj is based on submission, total submission to Allah Jalla wa ala. Look, Arafah. Arafah is decided by certain places. The Prophet Sallallahu decided that Arafah, and it is known that this is Arafah. Now, if the person stood maybe a few hundred meters outside the borders of Arafah, his hajj is not accepted. His hajj is invalid. He might be rewarded because of his effort, but his hajj is invalid. He has to come back again. This is Someone might say, well, what is this? What is this? This is not common sense. Come on, just if he stood up 20, 30 meters away. And some people even similarly question about the logic behind stoning the Jamara. And again, mashallah. They're going around the yeah, Kaaba. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense just to stone. Astaghfirullah al -Azim. And that's why we say that there are two types of activities. There are activities that are ibadat heavily regulated by Allah Jalla wa ala, and Allah Jalla wa ala want them like this. Like this shape, like this number, like this quantity, like this quantity, and in this place and in this time. Finish. Heavily regulated. These are acts of ibadah. Yeah. Tawqifiyah. Tawqifiyah. Yeah? You don't invent, you don't suggest, you don't recommend, you don't change, you don't alter, you don't reform. But on the other side, Allah Jalla wa Ala gave us the other types of activities that are non-listed ibadat, although they are considered to be ibadat. So the ibadat are of two types. The listed ibadat are heavily regulated, completely regulated by Sharia. They are what? Yeah, salah, zakah, siyam, and Hajj. Hajj. And the related ibadat to them. Dhikr of Allah Jalla wa etc. Yeah? They are heavily regulated by Sharia. The non-listed ibadat, like what? Eating is a ibadah. Sleeping can be ibadah. Sleeping can be ibadah. Or it should be ibadah. Because Allah Jalla wa ala commanded Ibrahim to make dua. Qul. Yeah? Ibrahim. Say. Inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. My salah, my nusuk, okay, clear. They are ibadah for Allah. But what about my haya, my death? Death. All of it for Allah, Rabbil Alameen, the Lord of the universe. So it means all of my life should be dedicated as ibadah. Any act we do, basically fulfilling the condition of sincerity for the sake of Allah and in accordance with the sunnah of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, will be rewarded, yes. will be considered as ibadah. Will be considered as ibadah. So the first condition, sincerely for Allah, how do I sleep for the sake of Allah? How do I eat for the sake of Allah? How do I have fun with my friends? How do I have fun with my children? You might go with your children for a swimming session or play with them. And it will be ibadah, you will be rewarded for it. Inshallah. So this type of ibadat is not heavily regulated as the listed ibadat. That's correct. The listed ibadat you have no say in them. No say. Yeah? Why Maghrib is three? Why do we need to do it in Mecca? Why the first ten days of the Hijjad are the most virtuous days? You have no say. Submission. And they teach us the principle of complete submission to Allah Jalla wa Ala. The non-listed ibadat, you have your freedom to act within a bigger circle. 
They are a bigger loosely frame. regulated, a bigger frame. Within that, you need to ask a question. You need to find what is better for you. Even Sharia allowed you that if you find that this way is not the best way, choose another way. The Prophet ﷺ used to wear certain clothes. You find that there are more practical clothes now. Wear them. It is not a problem. The Prophet ﷺ used to fight in a particular way. Now countries or armies became more developed. It is up to them. Sharia suggested just a framework how to run a country politically. Now things became sophisticated, complicated. You can. You can. There is no restrictions. But for the ibadat, don't interfere. Learn complete submission to Allah. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallahu khairan, Shaykh. MashaAllah, we learned it in a best way possible that how do we know that which are the ibadahs that which are regulated by the Sharia and which are the other things of a Muslim's life that which can be turned into ibadah and the Sharia has given much flexibility in it for us. Yes. Alhamdulillah. If I may say, I just remember something. Yes, please, Shaykh. Yeah, okay. You know this equality of men and women. See, if we know these principles that I have mentioned, and Allah is just, it is up to Allah. We will not be asking this question, are men and women equal or not? Because Allah also gave us the answer for this in a very simple ayah. Very simple ayah. What is that ayah? وَلَا تَتَمَنَّوْ مَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بِهِ بَعْضَكُمْ عَلَىٰ بَعْضٍ لِلْرِجَالِ نَصِيبٌ مِّنْ مَكْتَسَبٌ وَلِلْنِسَاءِ نَصِيبٌ مِّنْ مَكْتَسَبٌ خلاص, we, this headache of are they equal, what Islam says about equality. No, we have a more advanced formula than equality. And Muslims should not feel inferior because we don't have equality. We have the best formula of equality. In fact, if you want to look at equality correctly, then our formula of equality is better. Between men and women, the Quranic verse says, don't wish what Allah Jalla wa ala gave others, yeah, what he didn't give you. Simply, this is the simple translation. Don't wish what Allah gave others, what he didn't give you. Because Allah gave you some other things that others were not given. For men, their shares of virtues, and for women, their shares of virtues. That's it, the matter is done, completed in a very simple and organic way. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallahu khairan, Shaykh, for the wonderful discussion. Alhamdulillah, in today's episode, we covered, mashallah, a very important topic about why does Allah tabarak wa ta'ala give preference or blesses or consider certain days, certain times, and certain places special as compared to the other days. Inshallah, in the following episodes, we will continue talking more on the virtues of the first 10 days of Zul Hijjah. Until then, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Break down. Break down.